Today's video is sponsored by Shudder. As the world's premier streaming service for horror, thriller, and supernatural content, Shudder is spooky 24-7, 365. But they like to be a little extra for Halloween, and this year they're going all out by turning the normal 31 days of Halloween into the 61 days of Halloween, a two-month celebration of your favorite season featuring weekly originals and exclusive movie premieres. You can stream great thrillers, horror, and suspense for $5.99 per month or $56.99 per year. Shudder has the largest, fastest-growing human-curated selection of thrilling and dangerous entertainment. It's called the Netflix of horror for a reason. There are new spine-tingling thrillers, shocking horrors, and edge-of-your-seat suspense added weekly. You'll have unlimited access to stream ad-free on all your favorite devices such as iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, Xbox One, Amazon Fire TV, Google Chromecast, Roku, Android devices, and many more. Shudder has a unique collection of exclusive and original films and series, horror classics, and blockbuster hits. This whole month, I've been thoroughly enjoying Nosferatu Season 2. This second season picks up eight years after the end of Season 1, with Vic McQueen still supernaturally seeking to finish Charlie Manx, while Charlie, the child soul eater, wants vengeance and targets her eight-year-old son, Wayne. I've also been checking out Verotica, the directional debut of Glenn Danzig. It's a horror anthology that compiles stories from Danzig's line of comic books of the same name, consisting of three original segments that range from human sacrifice to eight-armed humanoid monsters. So what are you waiting for? Get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes titles like the acclaimed Tigers Are Not Afraid, One Cut of the Dead, Revenge, and the Creepshow TV series produced by Greg Nicotaro and based on the famous films by George Romero. To try Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use promo code Let's Read. That's S H U D D E R dot com, promo code L E T S R E A D. My name is Kayla, and I live just outside of Charleston here in West Virginia. Halloween used to be my favorite time of the year. Everything about the spooky season just filled me with a kind of childlike excitement. Like I honestly preferred it to Christmas by a whole lot, and as soon as the months ticked over from September to October, it kicked off a whole 31 days of celebratory spookiness for me. I even got a job in a Halloween store that was open all year round just so I could get some of that spooky holiday feeling during the spring and summer. But not anymore. Not since one Halloween brought one of the most traumatic experiences of my entire life with it. And that thing was a visit to an unlicensed Halloween haunt attraction out here in Appalachia. A haunt, as they become known, are Halloween-themed scary events that are put on every year from the end of September to October. After the success of more well-known haunts like Halloween Horror Nights and the Netherworld Haunted House, similar attractions popped up all over the country. Some were a little more fast and loose, whereas some, as I found out, are downright dangerous. I've never actually been to one of those things at the time a friend of mine suggested visiting one. But I'd be lying if I said I wasn't extremely curious. Erica, my best friend for as long as I can remember, said she'd heard about a haunt over near the Big Ugly Wildlife Park. There wasn't much info available about it online, but there were a few reviews of the place on Reddit, some of which were written by self-proclaimed horror junkies one of which said they've been to a bunch of haunts and that the one near Big Ugly was probably the most immersive, intense experience they'd ever been subjected to. Another was from a guy who said that he'd lasted hours on end in other haunts up and down the country, who laughed more than he'd jumped for the most part, but their visit to the Big Ugly had him tapping out before even an hour had elapsed. 
I told Erica that it might not be the best idea to go to the haunt if it was too much for even hardened horror fans, but she responded that they were probably just talking up the attraction after being given free entry or something. Like what happens with Instagram influencers only for gore hounds and not teenage girls. So, somewhat reluctantly, I agreed to go along with her. Only, unlike some of the more mainstream Halloween haunt attractions, this particular haunt didn't just let you walk up, buy a ticket, and stand in line. As far as we knew, it didn't even have a name. Some just refer to it as the haunt south of Charleston, others as the scariest place in West Virginia. But the most common reference to it seemed to just be the Big Ugly, so that's what we started calling it too. So as you can imagine, there was no website, no Google info tab, nothing like that. All there was was this weird email address that you had to message in order to receive a date and time when you were permitted to visit. We got the email address from one of the Reddit reviews, and it was something cryptic looking like 819v9l-33 at protonrocker.onion. I was over at Erica's place when we sent over an email saying like, how can we get ourselves a time slot? A reply came in within minutes. We rise from the ocean, with our names burned under our heads. Our command and control come from the winged one. But how many crowns do we wear? Erica read the reply aloud in pure confusion, wondering just what in God's name such a weird reply could have meant, and what it was referring to. She copied and pasted the reply into a Google search bar, but all she got was hits on poetry and Shakespeare, nothing about crowns or dragons or anything like that. She had no idea what the email was talking about, but something about it seemed oddly familiar to me, and for some reason, an answer came to mind. I told her to reply with just the word 10. She was all like, is that a guess? How do you know that? But I insisted it had to be 10. She fired off a reply and again the response came back in minutes. It was the right answer. Erica was astounded and by that point I would realized how I knew the answer. You see my grandpa was a preacher out in rural West Virginia, one of the fire and brimstone kinds that screamed at his congregation from his pulpit every Sunday. He knew the Bible off by heart but there was one section of it that he was particularly obsessed with and that was the book of Revelations. He always used to bark the same verse whenever he talked about the Day of Judgment. Something about a great beast rising out of boiling waters. One that was like a leopard and a bear with the mouth of a lion. Sounds pretty dumb now, but when I was a kid it used to scare the life out of me, and I never, ever forgot the part about it wearing ten crowns upon its horns. We thought the correct answer to the cryptic question would be enough to get us an appointment at the Big Ugly, but instead of getting our time slot... We only got another weird puzzle as a reply. Go to where the lonely Dutchman did his final dance and paint a welcoming picture. Now it was my turn to be like, what in God's name does this even mean? If they wanted us to go all the way to the Netherlands to get some painting done, we really were up the creek. But this time, it was Erica who had one of those light bulb moments. You see, she's really into true crime stuff, so like, Serial killers, mass murders, all kinds of detective stuff and missing 411 stories. They're just her jam. She said the moment she heard the word Dutchman and Final Dance, she knew immediately who they were referring to. That person being a dude named Harry F. Powers. Born Harm Drenth in Groningen, Holland, Harry Powers baited his victims through lonely hearts ads, claiming he was looking for love but ended up murdering them for their money. He was executed by hanging in Moundsville, West Virginia, hence the part about his final dance, which apparently referred to the death spasms that occur when somebody dies that way. Moundsville is up in the very north of West Virginia, a four-hour round trip from Charleston, so to save us the time of driving all the way there and back, we took a gamble on just getting a picture of the Welcome to Moundsville sign from Google Images and sending a copy of it to the Big Ugly email address. It worked. We got a reply that just said, 2100, October 30th, which we deduced was them telling us to go looking for the place at around 9pm on the 30th of October, only a few days away from the time we got in touch. We were on. 
Cut to the day in question and we set off in the late afternoon. It's just less than an hour's drive from Charleston out to the big ugly wildlife park, but we figured we'd better give ourselves a few hours to actually find the place, given that we hadn't been given an actual location, only to search the area around Mudlick Hollow. I was pretty apprehensive about the whole thing on the drive out there. Having heard some pretty grim stories about people's experiences at these gorilla style haunts, but Erico told me I was being a big baby that they wouldn't have gotten such glowing reviews if they weren't legit and, more importantly, didn't keep people safe. We were on foot around Mudlick for maybe like 40 minutes or so before we saw a trail of smoke rising into the air. Folks aren't allowed to camp anywhere in the Big Ugly, so we figured that the smoke trail had to be the haunt. And if it wasn't, we could at least rule out the location as being the place we needed to be. But after we hiked up and down steep hills and finally came across a piece of fairly flat land set between two inclines, all we saw was a trio of wooden teepee looking things and not a single living soul around to greet us. We weren't even sure it was what we were looking for, but still we started clambering down this fairly steep slope in the direction of the wooden structures, keeping our eye out for anyone who might look like they were in charge of the haunt. It was deathly quiet as we wandered up to the teepees and I started to get seriously uneasy as the sun was just starting to dip onto the western horizon. It would be dark soon and it wouldn't be easy to find our way back to Erica's car. We had like no food on us at all, with only these cheap flashlights to light our way. But right as I'm about to raise this point to Erica and suggest that we just get out of there before anything bad could happen, we heard a voice from the slopes above us. You girls lost. We looked up to see this rough looking dude peering out at us from behind a tree, a black bandana covering his face. I knew things were about to get weird as soon as I saw the face covering. No one who's up to anything wholesome ever covers their face up, like ever. Uh, we're just looking for the big ugly haunt, Erica replied, and I heard it in her voice that she was nervous too. You heard of it? Haunt, the guy replied. Don't know what you're talking about. Right when he said that, I heard something behind us and was so sure that I saw something moving behind one of the other trees. I started giving Erica this look as if to say, like, let's just scoot. And she nods and the whole thing had been a bad idea and now she was firmly aware of that too. Erica thanked the man anyway and told him we'd be on our way, but he called back that he had a better idea, and it's then that he produced a crossbow like out of nowhere and pointed the thing at us. His better idea, as he put it, was for us to lie flat on our faces in the dirt, and right as he says that, a bunch of other guys start appearing from behind the trees and walking down the slopes towards us. Run, and we'll catch you one of the other guys said. Hide, and we'll find you. Scream, and I'll cut your tongues out for I fry them up in their skillet. Apparently, we hadn't found the haunt. We'd found something far, far worse. For what seemed like hours, those masked up guys subjected us to the most terrifying, traumatic experiences of our entire lives. They stripped us, tied us to the trees, slapped us, fired crossbow bolts at us, and threatened us with things I don't think I really want to repeat here. The treatment got progressively worse as time went on, and the whole time they laughed and whooped as we begged them not to hurt us and to let us go. We swore we wouldn't tell anyone that they were out there. We promised them that we'd just leave and never come back. But they told us they didn't believe us. They said there was only one way to make sure we wouldn't tell on them, and that was to put us in the ground. We were half naked when they untied us from the trees and dragged us by the hair over to a patch of dirt behind their teepee things. Then, with crossbow and pistols pointed at us, they made us dig into the earth with our bare hands, telling us we were digging out our own shallow graves. I don't think I cried like that since I was a little girl, but still, I dug tearing up my fingers on rocks and roots as I thought about what a silly little girl I'd been to even risk trying to find some unlicensed haunt in the middle of nowhere. Suddenly, 
Erica refused to carry on digging, screaming at the guys if they were going to kill us that she wasn't going to waste any time digging a hole. I remember not being able to decide if she was being stupid or brave, dumb or defiant. She turned her tear-streaked face up to those psychos and just straight up told them no. But they just laughed, hooting and hollering before one of them asked us what we were thinking coming out this far into the woods. I can't remember what exactly was exchanged, but Eric had said something about how they wouldn't get away with what they'd done, that killing us would be the biggest mistake of their lives. Then one of the guys was like, Wrong on both counts. We are going to get away with this, and it's not a mistake, because you're not going to die. I remember they said that last part for sure because I immediately stopped digging and looked up, this feeling of hope going through me, like a warm feeling spreading in my chest. Congratulations, girls, the guy with the crossbow said. You just survived the big ugly haunt. We just sat there in the dirt, shivering, unable to believe what had just happened to us. Even Erica, who had been spitting bile at these guys just a minute before, seemed shell-shocked. One of the guys came along and threw our clothes at us, then offered us some hot coffee from a flask he had, along with a few cigarettes. Erica refused both, but I took the cigarette. I'd quit a few years before, but I just couldn't turn it down. It dawned on us during the car ride back home that they hadn't actually done anything seriously to physically harm us. Aside from the cold, a few slaps and the hair pulling, they barely touched us, and they didn't actually strip us naked at all. The whole thing had been a psychological game, albeit one that had scared the life out of us. They didn't even ask us for any money at the end of it. They just let us go. We talked about going to the police or writing up a warning on Reddit about the haunt, but we ended up doing neither. It was our own fault for looking for something like that, for even considering it to be a good idea or a remotely fun time. Well, I mean, I suppose this is a warning, written years later way too late, and it haunts me how many other people they will have gotten away with mentally torturing, but at the end of the day, we had gone looking for something to scare us. Maybe we were just super naive or whatever, but the point stands. They didn't come to us. We went to them. We went looking for something truly terrifying, and by God, did we find it. My name is Danny, and I live here in Liverpool in the UK. I'm 33 this year, so obviously my trick-or-treating days are well behind me, but the times I got to throw on a scary costume and head into the night with my best mates are some of the fondest memories I have from my youth. That's even aside from the free sweets, and we all know how stuff just tastes better when it's free. But maybe I'm looking back through rose-tinted glasses to a degree because I do remember one Halloween that was most definitely not all fun and games. In fact, what happened that night was probably one of the most terrifying things that's ever happened to me, even if it did take me a little while to realize the significance of it. So me and my childhood friends are all either 15 or 16 during the Halloween of 2003. We're on the verge of being too old to trick-or-treat anymore. Saying that, considering most of our voices had broken at the time, us turning up at people's houses was less cute kids begging for sweets and more like moody teenagers extorting people out of their haribu minis under the threat of egging. People were generally pretty sound about it, and only once did we have to actually throw an egg in anger, but there were many, many occasions where a homeowner would take a peek through the living room curtains before just refusing to answer the door. And it's not like we could egg everyone. We only had a pack of six and had to use them sparingly. Fun fact... A lot of places around ours just refused to sell teenage boys' eggs during the Halloween season. As one bloke said to me, You don't look like the type to take these home to Spanish omelette, do you, lad? Good point. Well made. Point being, there came a point during the evening when we were pretty dismayed at the pathetically low amount of chocolate we'd managed to get our hands on, which is what directly led 
two of us to make a huge error of judgment. So later on in the evening, maybe at about nine-ish, we're in this fancier neighborhood near the river, knocking on house after house and generally getting the knock back from the owners, until we come to this one house, where an older guy actually answers the door with a smile. We give it the old trick-or-treat greeting to which he responds by laughing warmly and giving us a little clap, which was unusual, but not entirely unwelcome. He starts telling us how not a single set of trick-or-treaters had knocked at his house all evening, and since he finds Halloween a great deal of fun, it had left him pretty dismayed. We get into a casual conversation with him about our costumes, who we were supposed to be and all that, and although I don't think he managed to pick up on a single reference, he was very complimentary. He then goes on to tell us that since it's getting late in the evening and he was unlikely to get anyone else calling at his house, that we were welcome to as much chocolate and sweets as we wanted. He told us that he'd stocked up on like a shed load of stuff, thinking he was going to get many more house calls than he ended up getting, and since he was off to bed soon, we could just help ourselves. Otherwise, all the chocolate would just end up sitting in his cupboards for a year, and he wasn't about to give kids year-old sweets come next Halloween. We basically hit the jackpot, thinking we could just rinse the old fellow of his sweets and make up for the paltry amount we'd collected over what had been an unusually fruitless trick-or-treating session. Only, he said there was one small problem. Since he was getting on in years and didn't get out much, his oldest grown-up son had come by to drop off all the sweets along with his usual weekly shopping. Then, without having thought it through, his son had put all the sweets in the top cupboard of his back pantry, one that was way too high for him to reach without doing his back in. If a couple of us were willing to help him reach the cupboards and take a few tins of soup for him in the process, the sweets were ours. All of them. Now I know what you're thinking. Who in God's name is daft enough to just wander into a complete stranger's house in the middle of the night? Apparently we were, and I'll explain why. Firstly, we were in the middle of our teens and most of us were big lads, hardly in a position not to be able to defend ourselves. Secondly, this fellow seemed pretty old and infirm, hardly a big threat to us, especially since the two lads who volunteered to go inside to help him outnumbered him two to one. And thirdly, the fact that one of us had managed to pilfer a bit of peach schnapps out of his parents' booze stash, which we promptly shared as soon as we were able, had seriously impaired our judgment. So pretty much as soon as the old bloke laid out the terms, two of us, Sam and Corky volunteered to go inside and help the fellow get a soup so we could get our sweets. They went inside. The old fellow shuts the door behind him after saying something about keeping the cold out and we wait outside in the street, buzzing about having hit the chocolate jackpot. Like I mentioned, we were all pretty tipsy from having shared that bottle of booze, so we're just sitting on the stone wall outside the bloke's house, chatting up and waiting. A few minutes go by... Sam and Corky haven't appeared yet, but I think we're just in too high spirits to really notice. A few more minutes go by and we start getting a little bit impatient, wondering what's taking so long. It had gotten colder and colder as the night went on and by that point it was actually starting to drizzle and none of us fancied getting soaked on the walk back home. So one of us gets their phone out and starts trying to ring Sam and Corky on their mobiles to which there was no response. We actually started cursing them out now, speculating that they were stashing some of those sweets away in their costumes or something so they don't have to share with the rest of us. The lad who tried to ring them does so again, shaking his head and getting annoyed as the rain started to get a bit heavier. Then, right at that moment, we hear a bang of something smashing against the wooden gate at the side of the old fellow's house. It was loud enough to make us all a jump, so we stand and turn around to see what could have made the noise. That's when I see Sam climbing over the wooden gate at the side of the house, like scrambling over it as fast as he could, looking like he'd seen a sodding ghost or something. We're all like, what's going on, mate? Watching him clambering over the wooden fencing near the back gate, before basically throwing himself over the other side and hitting the concrete driveway with a thud. God... The pure fear in his eyes when he started running down the driveway at us, shouting for us to run. We all start backing off like getting ready to leg it when Sam stops, turning back towards the house and saying something like, God, 
Corky's still in there. He's still bloody in there. Everyone starts asking him what just went on for him to come running out like that, but he doesn't respond. He just looks up towards the second floor of the house with a gasp. I turn to try to see what he's looking at and watch as one of the top windows of the house opens up. It was one of those kinds that opens by, like, rotating from the bottom, like it didn't open like a door, but like a hatch, if that makes any sense. We can't really see what's behind it thanks to the darkness inside the room, but out of, like, nowhere, we just see Corky emerging from the window, climbing out backwards while gripping onto the ledge. He's trying to edge out, Tomb Raider style, so he can drop feet first into a section of flower beds that were very fortunately placed underneath the window. I say very fortunately because I'm not messing. It must have been a 15 foot drop from the second floor window, like at least 15 feet. Then as we're watching him do this, there's like a flash of movement in the room above Corky, who then screams this proper horrible blood curdling scream before crashing into the flower beds beneath him. He fell so awkwardly too, like the first thought was that he had to have broken something having fallen that distance in such a way. So I start rushing toward him to help him up and get him moving, but to my surprise, he just bounces back up out of the flower bed and starts legging it down the driveway towards us, that same horrible look of fear on his face that Sam had. Then, that was that. We just bailed, sprinting as fast as we could down this long dark road that led towards the river, not stopping until we reached the promenade which was lit up in this ominous pumpkin orange streetlight glow pretty apt for Halloween, right? Not that it had occurred to me until months after. Only when we were certain we were a safe distance away from the bloke's house did we stop to catch our breath, but it didn't take long for those of us that had waited outside to demand to know what had happened. Only then did we see the blood pouring out of Corky's head. From a cut so deep, we could actually see this pale bit of tissue in the orange light, which turned out to be one of his actual bones. The old fella had stabbed at his hand as he'd been hanging from the window frame and that's what caused him to scream and drop. I remember Sam just sitting down on the concrete near the railings, just with his head in his hands. Maybe he was trying to fight back tears, I couldn't quite tell. But it was Corky that spoke up first. Fella pulled a knife on us, got us into the back pantry and pulled a freaking knife on us, he said, hands on his knees still panting. He had something else too, like his phone. He was a taser, lad. He had a bloody taser and my auntie had one that looked exactly like it. I'd know it anywhere. Sam interrupted. We were all just in shock and listened as they went on to describe how the nice old fellow we thought we were dealing with turned out not to be so nice or so old at all. Corky told us as soon as he had gotten them into the back pantry... He'd risen up from behind, all hunched over, and started to move a bit more limberly, which is right when Corky said he'd started to get the creeps, realizing that something wasn't right about the bloke. The old bloke pointed at the cupboard where the sweets were, told Sam and Corky to help themselves, then just sort of disappeared after telling them that he'd be back in a minute. The cupboard was apparently so high up that Sam had to give Corky a boost up to actually open it, and when they did actually open it, there was nothing inside at all. No soup, no sweets, no nothing. Then the next thing they knew, the fellow was blocking the exit to the pantry, holding a knife and what was, according to Sam, definitely a taser, and was ordering each of them to go upstairs. But that's not all. Apparently when the fellow turned up again, he was bollock naked, with only his shoes and socks on, we didn't get all the grim details out of either of them for a few months, but apparently the fellow wasn't suffering from any dysfunction, if you catch my drift. They'd said they'd listened to him at first, heading towards the staircase before they attempted to escape, with Sam heading out the back door, into the yard, and over the fence. But Corky was sort of trapped on the stairs of the bloke blocking his escape, so as I mentioned, he had to run upstairs, find a front-facing window, and just climb out of it. We considered calling the police right then and there. I mean, he'd obviously just stabbed one of our mates in the hand, but Corky had this other idea. Even with his adrenaline pumping, he explained, and 
pretty coherently that there was no way we could complain to the police, that he could see the older fella putting on that innocent old man act again and just telling the police that we'd forced our way inside and tried to rob him, that he'd defended himself, and that's how Corky ended up with a wound on his hand. I remember the lad was about to phone the police just stopping dead, thinking about it for a second, and putting his phone away. Five lads, way too old to be trick-or-treating, stinking of booze, versus the word of one sweet old man who was apparently no threat to anyone at all. It'd be an open and shut case for the police, or at least that's what he got into our heads. I'm sure there's people who might read this and disagree, knowing there was some way of us having evidence in our favor, or I don't know, something to prove we weren't lying. But I suppose we'll never really know, since we didn't act on it to find out. We stayed away from the neighborhood for years. We eventually managed to get it together to enact some kind of revenge, but when we backed the place, we found out it was some young couple living there, the older fellow apparently being long gone. We didn't get any closure at all, but closure is overrated. There's a lot to be said for the power of just forgetting, you know? But yeah, anyway, this has gone on long enough, I reckon, so I'll wrap it up. The story of the scariest thing to ever happen to me or anyone I know during Halloween, and honestly, it's probably the most disturbing thing to happen to me in my entire life, too. Me and my buddies used to trick-or-treat like every year when we were kids, without fail. And there used to be this one house that we always used to go to where this horrible family used to live. Like their kid was a huge bully in middle school, got suspended a bunch of times, and her parents didn't seem to be any better. Like most kids would just stop going to that house after they'd been told to buzz off year after year, but we grew to kind of relish the confrontation in a way. Like, it's not like the mom who used to answer the door knew exactly who it was each year. We had masks on. We're different stuff. We just got a kick out of seeing her get increasingly irate as the years went by. Only one year in particular, she gets really, really angry with us knocking over and over and actually chases us down her driveway and out into the street, which wasn't nearly as fun as just trolling her and seeing her get all angry. So that year, we decided it was time for the nuclear option. You see, we were heavy on the treat side of trick-or-treating, not so much the tricking sides of things. Even houses that told us to get lost or had ran out of candy didn't get anything bad thrown their way, we just sort of took it on the chin. But that time, getting chased away was a little too much for us to stomach, so we started hatching a revenge plot. One of us runs back to their parents' place, grabs a pack of toilet paper, then meets back up with us like a few minutes walk away from the house we planned to TP. We head back over there like we're on a secret mission or something, all hyped up to strike deep at the heart of killjoys everywhere. It was dumb, but we were just kids, maybe only like 12 or 13 at the time, so I guess being dumb was just part of the package of being that age. Anyways, we get there, sneaking up the driveway in pairs, hiding behind bushes and the car and whatnot, getting in position to strike. Then, like some little team of cartoon commandos, one of us gives the signal and we spring into action, hurling the rolls of toilet paper over the house, over the car, into the big tree that they had in their front yard, everywhere we could. Then boom, there's a gunshot. And the dad of the family runs around the back of the house, aiming a pistol in the air and hurtling towards us. He looked like a man possessed, sprinting towards us at terrifying speed, despite the fact that he was rocking a big old spare tire in his gut. We just bolt, running back down the driveway and pounding it into the street, splitting off into different directions as we're all just intent on getting out of there. But you know that saying, you don't have to be fast enough to outrun the bear, you just gotta be faster than your slowest friend? Yeah, that. Because as we're all running, I hear the scream from behind me, then the guy shooting. I turn to see one of my buddies on the floor, getting the snot kicked out of him by this guy, his bag of candy having spilled open with all the contents just glittering in the street lights. I run back and start begging the guy to stop, and he points the gun right at me, at which point I literally pee my pants. 
I'm not scared to admit it. I was a kid, and it's scary enough having a gun pointed in your face as an adult, let alone when you're like 13. Only when he takes the gun away from me and points it to my buddy's head that I find the will to start screaming. No, please don't. We're sorry. We're really sorry. Please don't shoot him. And the guy doesn't respond or even look at me that time. He just whips off my friend's mask and keeps the gun pressed against his temple and growling stuff about how he's going to blow his brains out right then and there. Who do you think you are? Creeping up on my family like that. I should waste you right here and now. And all this other stuff that has my young friend basically bawling his eyes out. It was horrifying. Actually horrifying. Scarier than any horror movie I'd ever seen. Scarier than any super realistic costume or Halloween decoration that any sick horror freak could have possibly dreamed up. I mean, I really did think the guy was about to straight up kill my friend in front of me. And it didn't take long until I was crying too. Then the guy does something to the pistol, cocks it back, puts the barrel to my friend's face again. I'm screaming, don't kill him, don't kill him, over and over. Then he pulls the trigger. But there's no bang, there's just a click. But even the click was enough to send my friend into absolute spasms of terror and wailing. I didn't know anything about guns at the time, and I really did think he'd done whatever you do to prep the thing to fire, and I think I was just too terrified to see or realize that what the guy had done, what he must have done thinking about in retrospect, is eject the clip, clear the chamber, then dry fire the pistol into my friend's face, making it look like he was about to shoot him, but actually not doing so at all. Then once we were good and broken, once we were too scared to do anything but stand or lie there, bawling our little eyes out, the dude says something about us learning our lesson, then walks off back up the street towards his house. I remember my friends sort of lying there in the street for a few minutes, just sniffing and crying while I sat down next to him. I say sat down, it was more like my wobbly knees just couldn't handle it anymore and I collapsed down on my bottom near him. We didn't say a thing for the longest time. We just tried to process what just happened. How a dumb Halloween prank could possibly have escalated into something so truly terrifying. Looking back on it, I know we were little jerks tempting faith like that. Going back year after year and we probably weren't the only group of kids who were angering this guy or deliberately targeting them for not being in the Halloween spirit. But I don't think we deserve that. No one does. I mean, this grown man subjected a tween kid to a mock execution in the middle of the street. After a while, we got up and I walked my buddy back to his house, where we told his parents everything that had happened. Needless to say, the cops got involved and the whole thing got way, way messy for a while. The guy ended up catching charges, and we got visits from the cops too to warn us about playing Halloween pranks like that. I'm not a lawyer, and this is like 30 years ago now, so don't quote me on any of this. I mean, I'd actually be happy to hear from anyone who could paint a more detailed picture of the laws that were broken that night, but technically, we were trespassing on their property and breaking a bunch of other harassment laws or something, and if that guy hadn't actually ran after us into the street, I think he might have actually gotten away with the whole thing. But since he did follow us and did the whole mock execution thing, he managed to pick up charges, and for a while it looked like he was facing a brief stint in prison. But the family wasn't exactly in the weeds financially, so from what I remember, they lawyered up and managed to get away with a suspended sentence. Although I do know the guy was banned from owning firearms in our home state, which I suppose was a win for us in some respects. But the lasting effects of that night stayed with me for a long, long time. I've had a severe fear of firearms ever since, like I can watch movies with guns in, no problem. Something about it just being on a screen kind of separates the reality of it for me for some reason. But in person, I literally get a sweat on if I see a gun, which actually posed a serious problem for me during things like your run-of-the-mill traffic stop, where I see a cop's gun and get all nervous. 
Like, I've had a canine unit called on me more than once because a cop assumes I get all nervous because I have something in my car that I shouldn't have. But I'm sure you guys can't blame me, right? That night was one of the most traumatic of my entire life. Perhaps the most traumatic. And I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that it was the last time I went trick-or-treating. Like, sure, my parents banned me from ever going again, but even if they didn't, I never wanted to be out on Halloween night. Ever. Again. I hate Halloween. I'm sorry. I know that makes me sound like a proper buzzkill, but I have to be honest. Halloween is without a doubt my least favorite night of the year, and I really hate how it's gone from just one night of it to like an entire month of dumb, spooky fun. But I promise it's not just me being a killjoy. For me, it stems from a deeply personal experience with people who didn't just see ghosts and ghouls as some harmless form of autumn entertainment. Let me explain. I was born in Yorkshire, here in the UK, but my parents are from Libya and North Africa. I'm sure I don't have to explain much about the recent situation in Libya, as it's been in the news an awful lot over the past nine years or so, but I think there's a lot about Libyan and Arab culture in general that a lot of people don't know about, especially when it comes to things that have pre-Islamic origins since the religion has pretty much come to dominate any news or discussion when it comes to the Arab world. One of these things is the concept of jinn. Jinn is a term used to describe spirits or supernatural creatures that exist in Arab folklore, creatures that are held responsible for misfortune, possession, and diseases. The word comes from the root word jan, which means to hide or to adapt. They're different from demons in the sense that they're not inherently evil and can sometimes be helpful and kind. In a lot of pre-Islamic works of literature, jinn can be summoned and bound to a sorcerer who can then manipulate their powers to their own advantage. Jinn are assumed to be able to appear in shapes of various animals such as scorpions, cats, owls, or even donkeys. Dogs are another animal often associated with jinn especially black dogs, which explains why a lot of Muslims have a weird fear of dogs. Jinn are also commonly associated with the wind, often appearing in mists or sandstorms as shadowy ghosts with no individual structure. Now, having grown up in the UK, I don't really believe in any of that stuff. I studied medicine at uni. I'm a rather rational person. I know that mental illness is caused by chemical imbalances, etc., and not just bloody spirits. But I can't say the same for my parents, or some of my other extended family who legit believe that certain illnesses or mental disorders are caused by being possessed by jinn or tormented by a shaitan, the word we use for demons or devils. So a few years ago, when my mom started to suffer from a deep, all-consuming depression, the immediate reaction wasn't to get her an appointment with a psychologist or therapist, it was to start doing all kinds of ancient rituals on her to remove the jinn from her body. In short, my aunt had someone perform a bloody Islamic exorcism on my mum, and having to witness it was honestly one of the worst chapters in my entire life, which, coincidentally enough, also happened to occur during the month of October. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember driving back from Manchester to my mum and dad's place in North Allerton, worried sick the entire time because I knew that I was about to witness something seriously distressing. I remember the look my aunt gave me when I suggested that what was about to happen maybe wasn't the most effective form of treatment and that my mum needed professional help. I mean, I wanted to tell them they were daft old bents who, medically speaking, didn't know their butts from their elbows, but you don't speak to your elders like that. Not in my culture. They scowled at me, told me I was straying from Islam and that I needed to basically get my head together and stop thinking like an English girl, even though that's exactly what I was. I feel like I should make it clear that I love my heritage and I love my religion. I'm proud to be Muslim and I wouldn't change a thing about myself, even if I don't strictly keep halal. But I'm telling you now, some aspects of my culture really annoy me. The misogyny is one thing. All those old bearded wankers telling us girls what we can and cannot do while being total bloody hypocrites themselves. 
But the anti-science thing is just on another level, and it baffles me. At one point, the Muslim world had some of the most scientifically advanced societies on the face of the earth, but somehow that all just went completely downhill, but I digress. One evening, pretty much my whole family gathered in my parents' house when a sheik arrives to perform the exorcism. From what I gathered, the whole process was divided into three stages and wouldn't take place over one evening, but a few days. The first stage involved removing all forms of distraction from the living quarters of the possessed person. The sheik, with the help of my aunts, removed anything musical from my mom's room, so all the CDs, the stereo, and my mom's oud, which is like a little Arabic guitar or mandolin type thing which she always loved to play for me and my sisters when we were kids. They then took away all of her jewelry and stuff. Basically, anything pretty had to be purged from the room, which obviously my mom found really upsetting since she took a lot of comfort in the things that reminded her of home. The sheik then told my mom and the rest of my family everything that was about to happen was the will of Allah, and that he was merely there as a kind of go-between, a mediator of sorts. The second stage, and perhaps the most disturbing for me, was when the sheik tried to actually communicate with the possessing spirit directly. Something came over my mom as he started to do this. At the end of the day, she believed in the process too, and she played right into his hands, saying some really horrible, perturbing stuff about being full of hate and loving the process of slowly killing the woman the thing was possessing. My aunt howled when they heard her talk like that. My sisters cried and my dad had to leave the room to keep himself from showing the women of the family that he was about to burst into tears himself. When my aunt started screaming, so did my mom. The cacophony of wailing and crying coming from that room that evening was just horrendous, and for months I used to hear it in my nightmares. The sheik demanded to know the most inappropriate things for my mom, the kind of thing a person is never supposed to ask another unless they're actually really, really intimate with them. It was absolutely disgusting, and in those moments I hated that man. I think I still do. The third stage took place the following day. The sheik came and cleaned the room down with the help of my aunts. Then they used a mixture of honey and water to wash my mom down with, and a kind of purification ritual that would cleanse her body and soul of any sin. She was utterly exhausted by that point. I'm also certain she hadn't eaten a thing in about three days and had barely drank any water. She looked terrible, and I was so, so scared she was going to die as a result of the stress and deprivation. Then, after the sheik put his white-gloved hand on her head and recited a few verses from the Quran, it was all over. He packed up his things as my aunts thanked him, then he left. My mom was fixed. Only she wasn't fixed, not at all. She's never really gotten better, and for a long time I think that exorcism bollocks only made her worse. Yeah, religion helped her. Praying and believing helped her to get a little bit better, but not anything that old wanker did to her ever made her remotely better. I suppose that's why I hate Halloween so much. I had to spend the rest of October listening to stories about demons and spirits, seeing people make light out of a subject that had given my family and I so much pain and torment. Because as I said... For some people, ghosts and ghouls and goblins are just something make-believe that bring a bit of light entertainment once a year, or for my weirdo boyfriend all year round. But for some people, they're very, very real. My name is Rosa. I live up near Edinburgh in Scotland, and this is the true story of the scariest thing that's ever happened to me on Halloween. I'm going back a few years, but on Halloween night, the cinema society at our uni decided to put on an outdoor showing of that movie, Alien. I had not seen it before, but a few of my pals said it was good, and since we were too old for trick-or-treating, but too young to go out drinking, that would be a way to have a good time without spending too much money. So we had an alright time watching the film and all of that. It wasn't as good as my pals had made it out, but it was still pretty enjoyable. Only the whole time, this guy in the same row as me keeps looking in my direction. You know, like when you can see the shape of someone's face in your peripheral vision, when they're staring at you. Yeah, that. 
I gave him a few looks as if to say, what are you looking at? But that didn't put him off. He kept staring for like the entire time the film was going on. He seemed a wee bit older than me with dark hair and quite a plain face, and he had a t-shirt with a little character wearing a blue and yellow jumpsuit type thing that was giving a thumbs up. I'm pretty sure it was from a video game, but I'm not sure which one. Anyway, when the film was over and me and my friends were walking back towards the bus stop, this car pulls up next to us really fast before slamming on the brakes. Then the same fellow jumps out of the car, the one with the video game t-shirt, and tries to actually drag me inside. I went absolutely rage and started scratching and biting him while my mates went mental too, scratching, punching him until he gave up, jumping in his car and driving off. We tried to take pictures of the number plate and all that, but they were too blurry to make anything out, so we had nothing to tell the police apart from a rough physical description. I don't think anything happened as a result of my complaint, like the police never got back in touch with me. So as scary as this whole thing was, I don't think it compares to the fact that the weirdo who tried to actually kidnap me that night is still out there, and it's probably only a matter of time before he tries something like that again. Only the next time, the girl might not be so lucky. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to put your honey in your Joel juice.